Hello everyone. I recently took part in a conference on war and intelligence organized by the Norwegian Defense University College. There I spoke about Russia's strategic and tactical narratives related to its aggression against Ukraine. Several colleagues asked me whether my presentation was published. It wasn't, so I decided to do this video blog to document some of the observations on Russian propaganda and disinformation that I've made so far. I hope these observations and other materials produced by the Center for Democratic Integrity will be interesting to a wider audience, so you may want to like this video, share it to your networks and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Talking about Russian propaganda and disinformation about the war against Ukraine, it's important to distinguish between different types of this malign activity. As I suggest in the title of this vlog, it's crucial to differentiate between strategic and tactical narratives of Russian psychological warfare. What are strategic narratives? Strategic narratives reflect the long-term vision of Russian political and kinetic warfare. More often than not, they reflect genuine deep-seated beliefs of the Russian leadership linked to Ukraine or the broader context of the aggression. Even if directed at different audiences, strategic narratives demonstrate some internal logic and are generally coherent. This, of course, does not mean that they are right or correct. We are talking over the Kremlin propaganda after all. What are tactical narratives? Tactical narratives serve as individual steps that aim to strengthen the validity of strategic narratives. Unlike strategic narratives, however, tactical narratives are are less coherent because they're extremely manipulative and usually appeal to emotions. But for the Kremlinist propaganda machine, it doesn't really matter whether tactical narratives are illogical or contradicting each other, as long as they contribute to the force of strategic narratives. And because tactical narratives are often irrational and inconsistent, their lifespan may be quite short or sporadic. They may emerge, disappear and then re-emerge again. The distinction between strategic and tactical narratives is not the only distinction relevant to our discussion. Moscow directs strategic and tactical narratives at different audiences, and I identify four major audiences of the Russian information warfare linked to its aggression against Ukraine. First is the Russian domestic audience. Second is the audience in Ukraine that Russia targets to destroy or undermine Ukraine's will to resist the Russian genocidal invasion. Third is the audience of the collective West where Russia aims to undermine support for Ukraine. And finally is the audience of the so-called Global South. Obviously, the Russian propaganda machine may use one and the same narrative to target not only one, but two or three different audiences because it is deemed efficient, more or less universally. For example, some narratives are persuasive for the global south in general, and at the same time for the regressive left in the west. Or a particular narrative may be appealing in Russia and among the far-right circles in Europe. And of course, there are subsets of these four major audiences. For instance, one can distinguish between China and India in the Global South, or between France and Lithuania in the category of the West. But here I don't want to go into great detail, not to confuse you any further, so I will focus only on strategic and tactical narratives that Russia uses to target the four major audiences mentioned above. Russian population, Ukraine, the West, and the Global South. Let's start with the Russian domestic audience. Here are three main strategic narratives. The Ukrainian nation does not exist, while so-called Ukrainians are simply confused or manipulated Russians. As a country, Ukraine was granted existence by Russia, and sovereign Ukraine is a project of anti-Russia. But there are many more tactical narratives that the Russian leadership uses to support their strategic messages. Let's look at them. Russia's war against Ukraine is not a war, but a special military operation. Those Ukrainians who oppose Russian rule are Nazis. NATO uses Ukraine to attack Russia. All Russia fights NATO, not Ukraine. Russia never lost wars. We will necessarily win. Ukraine commits genocide of ethnic Russians in the Donbass and elsewhere in Ukraine. Ukraine's territory belongs to Russia. We do not occupy Ukrainian lands, we return to Russia what is rightfully ours. Ukraine's leaders are Satanists. As you see, some of these narratives can be found outside of Russia too. By calling Ukrainians Nazis, Russia tries to dehumanize Ukrainians so Russian invaders are able to carry out a genocide of Ukrainians with less psychological distress. But the same message about Nazis is used in the West to trigger anti-right-wing sentiments and decrease support for Ukraine. However, some messages will only work in Russia. For example, perhaps the most peculiar of these, that Ukraine's leaders are Satanists, is one of those narratives with a very short lifespan. It was created after an incident in Russia involving Muslim recruits killing several Russian soldiers for offending their Muslim faith. Moscow needed to avoid inter-religious conflicts among the invaders, so it came up with this weird idea that would present Ukrainians as enemies of all believers, no matter what religion they adhere to. 
Some of these tactical messages remarkably reveal the pervasive superiority slash inferiority complex of many Russians. As they consider the Ukrainians inferior to them, they fail to cope with the military successes of the Ukrainian army on the battlefield. So their defense mechanism is to imagine that they are fighting with mighty NATO rather than with the Ukrainians. With the Ukrainian audience, the three main strategic narratives are as follows. Russians and Ukrainians are brotherly nations. Ukraine is part of the Russian civilization. Ukraine can only be successful together with Russia. And then there are tactical narratives targeting Ukraine. Ukraine's leadership betrays the interests of the ordinary Ukrainian people. The West will fight Russia to the last Ukrainian. The gay robber narrative. The West is degenerate and Ukraine should not join it. You can easily notice that strategic and tactical narratives targeting the Ukrainian audience are less aggressive towards Ukraine in comparison to those directed at the Russian or domestic audience. This can be explained by the different objectives that the Kremlin has in its own country and in Ukraine. In Russia, the Kremlin tries to justify its anti-Ukrainian genocidal intentions and occupation plans, while in Ukraine it aims not only to break the fighting spirit of the Ukrainian society, but also to pacify the Ukrainian population on the territories occupied by the Russian invaders. For the Western audience, Russia has the following major strategic narratives. Russia is a global power that has a right to have its own sphere of influence, and Ukraine belongs there. Ukraine as part of the West poses an existential threat to Russia and the West is using NATO to encircle Russia, and many more tactical narratives. The West attacks Russia because of inherent Western Russophobia. Ukraine is run by Nazis, or at the very least has an immense Nazi problem. Western sanctions are damaging for European businesses and households. Ukraine is one of the most corrupt countries in the world, it cannot be part of the West. Russians and Ukrainians are one people. Russia is interested in peace negotiations, but Ukraine and the West are not interested in peace. European support for Ukraine will result in the geopolitical decline of Europe. The US uses the Ukraine war to cement its position as the dominant power. Western weapons given to Ukraine will end up with international terrorists. Nuclear threat. The West should not oppose Russia because it has nuclear weapons. Or Ukraine is making a dirty bomb. Especially with these tactical messages, you can see how the Kremlin and its henchmen aim to exploit sensitivities and anxieties of Western nations related to right-wing ideologies, nuclear non-proliferation, West European anti-American sentiments and American self-hatred, international terrorism, corruption and other phenomena. And with the messages about the nuclear threat, you may have already noticed that Russian officials either talk about Russia's own nuclear capabilities or imagine a nuclear threat coming from Ukraine, a country that gave up its nuclear weapons in the 90s in exchange for the useless security assurances from the Russian Federation, United States and the United Kingdom. Finally, the Kremlin is pushing three strategic narratives for the Global South. Russia is the leader of the international anti-imperialist and anti-colonial front. The West is using the Ukraine war to reclaim global domination. Ukraine is part of the Russian legitimate sphere of influence. It's not very difficult to imagine that the second and third strategic messages directed at the Global South may well work with some left-wing and right-wing isolationists, populists and anti-globalists in the West. The first strategic narrative, however, the one about Russia as the leader of the anti-imperialist front, is likely to work only with some authoritarian leftists, also known as tankies. Russian tactical narratives targeting the global south are curious in that they are focusing predominantly on the west rather than Ukraine. Because for many in the global south, especially in Africa, Latin America and southern and western Asia, there is little difference in perception of Russia and Ukraine. In the Kremlin's messaging for the global south, Ukraine is bad not because it's presumably anti-Russian, but because of its ties to the often demonized western world. Western support for Ukraine is driven by western anti-Russian racism. Ukraine, with Western support, endangers global food security. Ukraine is developing biological weapons in secret US-funded biolabs. In the West, in Ukraine, we find some of these narratives totally ridiculous, such as, for example, the claim that the US has trained an army of migratory birds to carry biological weapons developed by the Ukrainian army. However, narratives such as this one are simply not directed at us. They are targeting the Global South, where conspiracy theories about Western plans to cull certain populations are especially widespread. But it's perhaps not surprising that conspiracy theories about secret American biolabs in Ukraine are also popular with QAnon followers and other far-right online and offline activists in the West, and especially in the US with its rich conspiracy theory culture. In conclusion, I want to address very briefly a question of the efficiency of Russia's strategic and tactical narratives related to its aggression against Ukraine. 
If you, before watching this video, heard all or most of the narratives that I discussed, then it's fair to say that Russia has been successful in delivering these messages to you personally. Directly, if you knowingly or unknowingly consume Kremlin spots and propaganda and disinformation products, or indirectly if you heard these narratives from a friend or any other of your contacts. But that is only one part of the Kremlin's success, I'd say one third of it. Yet another one third is if you consider any of these narratives as a legitimate point of view on the developments in and around Ukraine. And the Kremlin's particular psychological operation is a complete success if you have been convinced that a specific narrative is not only a legitimate take on the Russian aggression against Ukraine, but is actually true or correct. Well, I'm sure that the audience of our channel hasn't got any further than the first stage, namely being aware of the concept of the Russian-Ukraine related propaganda. But I still hope that my observations will help you remain better informed on the challenges of Russian information warfare against Ukraine and frankly all of us. So do subscribe to our channel to boost your information hygiene and become even more resilient to Russian malign influence. And by the way, if you think that some other major strategic or tactical narrative directed at a particular audience should be added to my list, you're welcome to share your thoughts in the comment section.